And so you can see that the banks running a, a fractionary reserve system with a price which is now getting out of their control is a very, very serious issue. Yeah, and Alistair, maybe the last one for you today, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'll say, would it be correct if I summed up a lot of what we've talked about today? Are we at the point now where they've run out of metal and someone is saying, I want my metal and it's not there? Broadly, yes. I mean, we're getting to that point. We are, we are at that point in the sense that uh, the, the physical liabilities in the bullion markets are considerably greater than the metal available. Hello there, my friends. Chris Mark is here with you for Arcata Economics. And today, an episode interview I'm pretty darn excited about because obviously, well, maybe you don't recognize him yet. I know hasn't been too many videos of interviews of Alistair McLeod, but Nice to see him over there. I'm sure you've read his research. He's been covering the gold and silver markets for goldmoney.com with James Turk for years, um, has done some incredible research. You've heard him on King World News. So Alistair, it's really a pleasure to have you joining me here today. How is everything going with you, sir? Well, it's my pleasure, Chris. Um, I'm alive and well, <laughs> and there's lots and lots to write and talk about. Yeah, and, and certainly when you say alive and well, seems a better condition than perhaps the LBMA, the Federal Reserve, or some of these other fascinating situations we've been following. To start with, I'd like to read a quote that you mentioned last week on King World News saying, I expect the paper currencies to collapse within the year. Certainly that makes a lot of sense. Obviously the timing of when do these things get priced in you know, some people, some days we handle it better than others, but uh, I'd love to hear you expand on that and what you're seeing. And do you really think we're finally going to see not just the paper currencies, but of course, gold and silver repriced? Well, it's uh, the answer, I'm afraid, has got to be slightly long, lengthy. Um, but if you look at uh, past monetary collapses, they tend to happen in two phases. You get a, a run-up phase, which can be very, very long, uh, where uh, the currency loses purchasing power over a considerable period of time, but generally at a fairly, um, at a pace which sort of relates almost to the quantity of money that's being produced. Yep. Uh, there then gets to a point where the public begin to realize that it's not prices going up, but the purchasing power of the paper currency going down. Now, the moment they really understand that, they start dumping it for goods for anything, just to get out of the paper money. And uh, I mean, so if you go back to the German inflation in 1923, in fact, it started before the First World War because um, all the arms buildup that the Kaiser and Bismarck uh, spent their money on was all done out of inflationary printing. Um, so it continued after they lost uh, at a higher pace, but it wasn't really until uh, about May 1923, when the public finally realized what was happening to money. And they then started dumping it uh, as soon as they got it. I mean, just get rid of it. I mean, you heard the stories about, uh, you know, wheelbarrow loads full of yeah, yeah. money. Uh, you go in to buy something and someone's stolen the wheelbarrow and left the money on the pavement. You know, it, it, that's, it's that time really. Uh, from May 1923 to November 1923, money in Germany went to zero and it happened very, very rapidly. Uh, what interests me about the current situation is that the best parallel I have seen in history is what happened in France exactly 300 years ago. And that was when John Law, the Scots adventurer, if you like, had um, the same epiphany as John Maynard Keynes had oh boy. 70, 80 years ago. And that was that if you could expand the quantity of money, you would stimulate the economy into a high level of production. Um, the bits on the side were very, very similar in the sense to Keynesianism. Now what he did 
was in it, it happened actually very rapidly but what he did in about 1715 ish was he got very friendly with the duke of orleans who was acting as prince regent and uh, he managed to persuade the duke of orleans uh, to let him have a banking license he started printing money taking in specie printing money and using that money for other um, for other things uh, at the same time he got a monopoly on france's um, export trade not just to the americas but also worldwide and he bought that right um, effectively from the crown which had been surrendered by people who had uh, trading rights before in lieu of taxes so he he had all france's import and export business tied up mm -hmm. licensed now the events that led up to the collapse is what we call today the mississippi bubble because the centerpiece of it was the French interests in North America, which the Louisiana and all the rest of it. So, I mean, you'll know a lot more about that end of it than, than I would. Um, the timing of it was that his currency created a rate of inflation, price inflation in the country, um, but it made uh, his friends, and people in the financial centers, an awful lot of money. Yep. Because what he did was he issued shares or entitlements in partly paid form. So while something went up maybe 50%, in 10% paid form, it went up 500%. So, you, you know, suddenly people were making huge amounts of money, having put very little money down. Come um, around about, I think it was February the 28th, 1720, it was planned to merge the Mississippi Company with his bank. Now, his bank by then had become France's central bank, and his livre, which he printed, was the money in circulation. Mm -hmm. He used the printing of money to support and ramp up the shares in the Mississippi venture. Now, today we have exactly the same thing. The Fed is printing money to ramp up government debt okay I was say, debt, not equity sounds familiar <laughs> yeah <laughs> the only difference between john law's scheme and keynes's scheme is john law's scheme was restricted to france yep. keynes's scheme has gone global so this is a lot more serious going back to 1720 what happened with john law's scheme was the effect of printing money to support the share price, if you like, in the Mississippi venture, the financial asset, as it were, uh, was to tie in the future of the financial asset with the currency itself. Mm -hmm. So when one collapses, they both collapse. What happened was that by September, there was notionally in France some value in the shares. They had fallen from around about 12,000 livres to around about 1,000 livres. But in the foreign exchanges, the value of the Libra was worthless. Yep. It happened between February and September. Now, if you read through um, you know, the events just in the run up to that, you could see that he was having difficulty supporting this um, mixture, if you like, of, of um, asset ramp uh, with his currency it was beginning to come unstuck just a little bit before it. So we are where he was perhaps in around about December 1719. So the point is that we today face exactly the same thing, but on a global scale. Now, the other thing that we have today, which he didn't have, is something far worse. And that is a banking system, a global banking system, which has got some very serious weak points. In fact, I'm releasing a paper on that today, which your viewers would be interested in looking at. So if you go to Gold Money Insights and see my latest article, which is published today, Thursday, the whatever day we are, I can't remember. What we'll day get, are we? We'll We're 21st, 21st. Yeah, you will, get, you will get chapter and verse on the whole thing. The point is that European banks, the GSIBs, the globally systemically important 
banks. These are the ones which must not fail. Some of them are so highly geared on the relationship between their market capitalization, which is what the market is saying these banks are currently worth, and their total balance sheets. Now, I don't have the figures right to hand, but um, you're looking at Barclays Bank in the UK, 62 times. You're looking at um, Deutsche Bank, I think that's close to 100 times. There's a French bank, I can't remember quite which one, I, I, which one it is, doesn't really matter. But these are important ratios, which the regulators don't look at. Right. What the regulators look at is internal capital. They look at the balance sheet. But what the market looks at is, you know, what actually is this com company worth? What is this bank worth? And typically, when you see that Deutsche Bank's market capitalization is on a loan to book of 20%, sorry, price to book of 20%. The market is telling you that this is a load of rubbish and to be avoided. I mean, you could take the other view and say that you buy things under book, it's cheap, you know, good luck to you. But this is a time of escalating credit risk. Do you really want to get stuck with something where the market is saying it's already bust? and uh, uh, risk is rising the whole time, I would suggest that that is a very dangerous situation. I am very much of the opinion that we will have a banking crisis in the next month or two. Wow. Now, if we have a banking crisis, we then have a very interesting dynamic coming into play. People will want to get out of banks. They will want to get out of bank deposits and so on and so forth. What do they buy? Residential property? No, residential property prices will be going down. Why? Because there won't be the mortgage finance uh, available to sustain the prices. Okay, commercial property. Ah, retail outlets are going down the pan, <laughs> as indeed is office space. No, so that's a no-no. So what do we do with our money? Do we buy shares? Well, they've gone up, but, with the way the global economy is going, and also if you're looking at America, the American economy, you look at the Eurozone, the Eurozone economy, whatever, do you really want to buy into a collapsing economy? This is difficult. Now, the thing that will collapse it, of course, is after the banking crisis, you will find that government debt will go down in value very substantially. Why? because the banks, the coronavirus, and everything else you can think of, they're chucking money at. Yep. And this basically means that not only will you see the budget deficits for governments escalate, but you will also see the way it is financed. It is financed by money printing, okay? But before we get there, we've got a problem with the banks. The banks will be rescued, I'm sure. We just hope they don't do bail-ins, because a bail-in, is at the expense of the private sector. A bailout is when the government basically takes it on the chin. If they do bail-ins, then bondholders and large depositors are gonna run for the hills. And we don't know where they'll run to. I mean, they will certainly run to safer banks if they can. But this is a very, very dangerous situation. So we just have to pray that they don't follow the bail-in route. The problem is, that after the Lehman crisis, the G20 agreed that they should all introduce legislation to do bail-ins next time. So the law says they've got to do bail-ins. We just have to hope that the law is ignored in this respect. So we now have the problem, what, you know, going back to the problem, if you like, of depositors in the banks, if you large depositors, what are they going to do with it? Can they get into cash? Because traditionally what happens with a bank run is people queue up around the block and they try and take the money out in folding notes. Now that's fine because what happens is that, okay, the bank goes bust, but if you've got your money out, you're sitting on physical cash and that, if you like, is a reservoir. It's a money reservoir. If you can do that, if everybody could do that, 
then there is little doubt that the increased quantity of money in the physical possession of the consumer means that prices on the high street, consumer prices, if you like, will tend to decline. And that's why we sort of tend to associate um, a banking crisis with a collapse in prices. Admittedly in the past, gold or gold substitutes were the money. But this time, there is no ability to draw out cash because the central banks and the regulators have instructed the banks in their charge not to pay out cash. They don't like to see cash out there for the simple reason that um, it's expensive for them to produce. Uh, they think it's tax, you know, a lot of it is tied up in tax avoidance and they use the excuse that criminals use it. So you can't get into, into cash. So what do you do with your bank account? If you really are worried about leaving money in the banking system, then you short circuit that bit I described, whereby people sort of take out cash, they think cash is, uh, is king, uh, they suddenly don't have that ability. So the crack up boom, whereby they suddenly get rid of all their, crack, uh, their cash, what they're doing and says they get rid of their deposits, so the collapse, if you like, in the purchasing power of the currency misses out that step of going into cash first. Yep. So we can see that this, once it starts, could happen extremely quickly. That's roughly where we are today. Yeah, and I appreciate you putting that all in context because, you know, there's some people who are saying, all right, well, we've been hearing the dollar is going to collapse one day and gold and silver are going to go up. Obviously, the last nine years, we've been having our patients tested. But I think that's what has me so intrigued, where it's like you keep pushing that beach ball underwater. The, the actions they've taken, it, it's hard to see any other outcome than what you just described of it happening at some point. A lot of these things, not just grinding or churning higher over the years but like you said a big break yeah but where my conclusion differs from virtually everybody else's is everybody else i've talked to who thinks that um eventually paper currencies will disappear they think they've got five or ten years before it happens they think there'll be a monetary reset now they may well try a monetary reset but with things happening very very quickly i just wonder whether they'll manage to do it because central planners take time to come up with, with a new answer. And the problem, of course, that the central planners have is they're sold, so sold on John Law, I mean Keynes, <laughs> that they don't actually understand economics. Yeah. They really don't. It, it's funny you mentioned that. I remember I went to Wharton for an MBA, which I thought, you know, just sit there, pay attention. You know, these are the smart guys. You were teaching Keynesian economics. And I see now how it's like you don't become the vice president at Goldman or Lehman if you're talking about gold and silver. But the other thing you mentioned there is how at some point, a lot of money looking for a safe haven. I'm, I've had a focus on silver these last couple of years. And, you know, especially with what's happening now, Fed getting ready, unlimited printing wasn't enough. They need more aggressive action. Um, so when gold starts crossing 1900 and 2000, given the way American funds invest on momentum, is it going to be possible to see a silver price below 20 bucks as that really starts getting out of control? Well, it's, it's completely mispriced for what's evolving. Um, at the moment, the action basically has been in gold because um, we all know that gold is the money, if you like, that the public would choose in the absence of fiat currencies. Um, they shouldn't even choose fiat currencies, but of course fiat currencies got there by being backed with gold and then pretending to be backed by gold and then suddenly saying, oh, we don't need gold. So um, at the moment it's all on gold. Now we have had a hiatus in the paper markets whose expansion incidentally, has all been about, particularly in the futures markets in America, has all been about soaking up demand for gold at times when perhaps paper currencies would otherwise be under threat. So now we have a situation where the futures market got broken, if you like, 
because it's not not because you had uh, gold in the wrong place or mines were shut down and i mean that all that's just absolute nonsense the problem basically was that the coronavirus started shutting down western economies at a time when the bullion banks the trading desks were short in the gold market you then get the central bankers coming out and saying we will print however much money is required to rescue the economy from this unexpected event. So you're sitting there short of huge numbers of contracts and suddenly the game has changed on you. And that is the problem. There is another element of it. If you look at it from the point of view of senior management in the banks, because in most of these cases, uh, a bullion bank is actually the bullion desk one of many desks, like a foreign exchange desk, blah, 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 uh, in a major bank. Head office turns around and says, we've got to reduce the amount of money that we commit to markets because we have got liquidity constraints. Also, I have seen, this is me as managing director or chief executive, if you like, of a big bank, which has got a bullion desk. I have seen that there has been a fundamental change in uh, monetary policy. I don't think that we should be running short positions in gold. So even though I employ a specialist and he's made lots of money for the bank in the past, he's now sitting on book losses. I'm going to instruct him to curtail those book losses. And that's been the problem. That basically has been the problem. It's, it's, it's come through in uh, the exchange for physical, which is a very specialist little niche uh, whereby um, you, you sort of, the bullion banks provide, if you like, an arbitrage bridge between London and COMEX. Um, and that suddenly started failing. It just, it was driven out really because normally they could contain any premium arising on COMEX to two or three dollars. But then suddenly you had this panic. The whole thing had changed completely. The bullion banks, Trading desks needed to close their positions. They got scared, whatever. You could even say that the, you know, the buyers in the market, uh, the speculators saw this coming and just upped the ante against the banks, whatever. It really doesn't matter, but you can see how they got wrong footed. And that's roughly where we are. And I think that the, the message from this is that even if things calm down, then I think you'll find that banks will be withdrawing or lowering their limits, their trading limits within Comix. So there is, if you like, um, a completely new market paradigm as far as uh, the paper markets are concerned. And the crisis itself, in effect, because this is something, a change in monetary policy, um, it's a global change in monetary policy, the crisis actually is in the physical market. What we have seen is by the lack of, uh, of uh, um, uh, physical bullion available in any of the markets. And they've continued to try and suppress the price because guess what, we're short, we don't want to see the price go up and it's just made the crisis worth, worse. Yeah, and it seems almost as if it sets up a bit of a prisoner's dilemma, what you were just describing, where I've wondered are these are these guys, they just figure, well, we'll always knock the price down when we have to, or are they, getting a little concerned when the Fed's running a hyperinflation campaign, it wouldn't seem an ideal time to be short so much metal. Again, uh, I'd also like to hear comments on the LBMA. We saw that story last week. HSBC says they lost 200 million in a day on the exchange for physicals. Uh, several folks have reported that on March 24th, the day after two market makers got blown out. I don't know whether that includes HSBC or not. Um, any thoughts on how this is going to unravel? And like you said, it seems like it's set up to be sooner than later. Yeah. Well, uh, the LBMA did what it could to protect its members, which is typical. Um, and it's released press announcements saying there's plenty of gold in London. LBMA vaults, and they include the Bank of England in this, though it's not an LBMA member. Uh, I can't remember, it's 8,300 tons, whatever it was. But the problem is that when you drill down 
take all the Bank of England stuff out because that's owned by central banks. I'll, I'll say something about that in a moment. Um, you're then looking at, uh, I, I, th I think it's something like three and a half thousand tons, something like that, in uh, independent vaults, you know, JP Morgan's, HSBC, um, Brinks, um, you know, Loomis, or so, you know, all the independents as it were. Uh, now, if you actually then take out of that, the physical gold held by custodians for ETFs, you're then reducing this down to a liquidity of less than a thousand tons. The liquidity is probably quite a bit less than that because also in these vaults uh, is bullion, which is stored on behalf of uh, wealthy people. Um, the, you know, sort of people who, who generally want to hold gold, physical gold, in a vault outside their own country. And there's quite a bit of that. I think that what this has shown is that the liquidity in London is actually very, very low. And the idea that used to happen in the past that they would probably be long in London and they would hedge the position by going short in um, uh, on Comex, which is the sort of story that uh, Jeffrey Christian tells us, that's basically bl been blown out of the water. You see, the other problem is that the banks, in, yeah, the banks in London, the bullion banks in London, they don't just trade uh, on, you know, in, on the LBMA and also on COMEX. They also run unallocated bullion accounts for their customers. I mean, that's the, basically the root of the whole thing. Now, this is a fractionally reserved banking system, except it's in gold, not in dollars or sterling or euros or yen. So... Essentially, they are uncovered on those positions in exactly the same way as uh, a bank might have a capital of a um, billion dollars and have outstanding liabilities of 20 billion dollars. You know, if you get uh, something going wrong on the 20, the effect on the one, as I was describing earlier, is extremely serious. And so you can see that the banks running a, a fractionary reserve system with a price which is now getting out of their control is a very, very serious issue. Yeah, and Alistair, maybe the last one for you today, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, so I'll say, would it be correct if I summed up a lot of what we've talked about today? Are we at the point now where they've run out of metal and someone is saying, I want my metal and it's not there? Broadly, yes. I mean, we're getting to that point. We are, we are at that point in the sense that uh, the, the physical liabilities in the bullion markets are considerably greater than the metal available. Of course, I mean, most of the time we expect these liabilities to expire. I mean, particularly in the futures market, they expire. In London, they just roll it the whole time, which is why you get such a huge, huge, great turnover. Um, but I know you're going to have Andy Maguire on. He will He's far more expert than me, I can assure you, in the ins and outs of that. But basically, I think we've got very much towards the end point. And it's very difficult to see, particularly since bullion markets are not discounting the banking crisis that I now forecast. Mm -hmm. You can see that when that hits the headlines, the situation, the price in London, the price in Comex has got to be completely different. And it's getting very difficult for bullion banks to control. I think it's got out of their control in effect. I mean, you, if you look at what's been happening recently, they've been trying to suppress the price, trying to get some normality back into the market. I mean, it was what? It was back in uh, March. They hit the price in order to try and get open interest down from just under 800,000 contracts. They got it down to under 500,000 contracts. That's now creeping up. They can't stop it. So it's an interesting situation. Silver is, is also interesting because um, that has been out of the headlines and then literally in the last couple of weeks, it's begun to really spark. The thing that's interesting about silver is that if silver was money, like it was before 1873 in Europe, then the right gold-silver ratio is around about, I don't know, 15 to 17 times. 
we were up at 100, just nearly 120 times, might have been slightly over 120 times recently. We're now back almost to, to 100, exactly. The point is that we're talking about a situation where at the moment there is an increasing likelihood that gold will return as money. If gold returns as money, then silver will as well. There won't be a gold-silver ratio as such, managed, if you like, by central banks. But what I do see is silver returning to coinage. Because once you get the failure of fiat currency, people will take nothing less in their coinage. So uh, I, silver is an interesting one. Poor man's gold, if you like. Uh, and certainly it's been like that throughout history. You know, the people with loads and loads of money go for gold. The people who exist day to day um, use silver. So, but that, I think that, that seems that to be back. me. I mean, they're running for world's biggest silver bull over here. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's just fascinating what's going on. And Alistair, I can't thank you enough for joining me. I had a feeling today was going to be a good episode. And real quick, before we let you run, I got the site pulled up here. And maybe if you could just let folks know about some of the things Gold Money does, and in particular, also your research, but Obviously, we hear a lot, you know, that if you don't hold it, you don't own it. So yeah. in some situations, you know, there are rightful concerns. Um, I don't know if people know this. I actually used to write a little bit for gold money before you <laughs> took over the whole department and have done such a great job. But if you could just let people know, uh, you know, some of the things that they should know about gold money and what you guys are doing there. Yes, of course, Chris. I mean, basically, what we do is we store money. Uh, sorry, we, yeah, we store real money <laughs> in physical form outside the banking system. And by real money, I mean gold, silver. We also do the platinum group metals, uh, uh, platinum and palladium in particular. Uh, and we store it. Um, we've got, I think, 11 locations around the world. So if you're an American and you're worried that there might be another confiscation, just make it a bit more difficult for your government, store it in Switzerland or store it in you know, wherever you want. So we've got, we offer that flexibility. The key to it is to understand that it is outside the banking system. People who have uh, gold and silver stored with a bank have the potential risk of having to establish that it's theirs and not the banks. And, um, you know, this is not a situation you want to get into if you believe as I do, that uh, things are getting considerably more dangerous. So that's what we do. We buy and sell and store for our customers. Um, and uh, I write uh, research and I do an article every Thursday. So I've got one coming out this afternoon uh, and I do a market report on Fridays and that's European timed as it were, because obviously I'm on, on the other side of the pond from you. Um, so those are the two regular things that I do as an article on Thursday and a market report on Friday. And we will have this week's article in the description field below, right down there. So now as we're wrapping up, you can go click on that. And Alistair, are you on Twitter too, if people would like to interact and uh, talk with you a bit there? Yes, uh, at McLeod Finance. All right, we'll have that down there as well. I just want to say thank you again for joining me. A lot of great things you shared here today. Certainly a fascinating time in history. And I think that when we're prepared and understand what's happening, it doesn't have to be Armageddon or the end of the world. And I really appreciate folks like you that are speaking up, sharing these things so that people can be prepared. And yeah, we'll look forward to doing this again soon. I think we're going to have an exciting second half of the year. So thanks again for being here with me today. That's my pleasure, Chris.